All right, welcome back, everybody. We are answering your listener questions as we do at least once uh, every four weeks on the podcast. Shannon Vasconcelos is here. Shannon, you have more questions for me. Let's go. I sure do. This one comes in from Lisa, and Lisa asks, several times I've heard you mention, I think it's 16 qualities that high school counselors rank students in as they submit letters of recommendation for college admissions. Could you say what those 16 qualities are? I can't find it on the internet and no one seems to know about this. It's very mysterious, but it seems like it would be hugely helpful to know. Sure. Um, Lisa, I will be honest with you. I saw this question and I thought, I have never talked about the 16 qualities. (laughs) Literally, I had no idea what you're talking about. Uh, It is possible, absolutely, that one of my other hosts or a guest had talked, mentioned this before, but... um, I very quickly realized that what you were talking about is the teacher recommendation form for the common application. So first thing I'm going to do is just hold this up. You're probably not going to be able to see it all that well, but it's the teacher evaluation form for the common application. If you Google, I will tell you exactly what I Googled to get there, common app recommendation form. Um, you will, it will pop up and there'll be something that says something like just, they're also a PDF. And if you click on that, you will see PDF versions of all the forms, uh, that can accompany the common app. So you can print this out yourself and see it for yourself. But here's what I will tell you on this evaluation form. They are, um, they ask for the teacher's information. They ask how long they've known the student in one, in what context, um, they ask what grade level they taught them in. Uh, and they ask for the courses that they taught the student in. And then there is this grid right here. Um, And the grid includes 15 qualities with the 16th being an overall rating, right? So they're asking the teachers to grid in their responses. So on the following qualities, academic achievement, intellectual promise, quality of writing, creative original thought, productive class discussion, respect accorded by faculty. I misread that one originally and I thought to faculty, like, oh, they're looking for a respectful student, Uh but no, respect accorded by faculty. So what do, what is your sense of how faculty um, perceive this student? Disciplined work habits, maturity, motivation, leadership, integrity, reaction to setbacks, concern for others, self-confidence, initiative and independence, same line, and then that overall. And the rankings that they have to choose from are no basis. So if the teacher really has no idea about any of these, they can check no basis. And then the other rankings are below average, average, good, which in parentheses is above average, very good, which in parentheses is well above average, excellent, which is top 10%, outstanding, which is top 5%, and one of the top few I've encountered, which is top 1%. Here's what I can tell you in talking to my colleagues about what we saw most commonly on the uh, admission side when we were reading these teacher recommendations. First of all, more teachers than not will send in a written evaluation. So this form is really nice and maybe they fill it out and maybe they don't. So it wasn't uncommon when I was at Penn for a student to, um, for a teacher to submit a form that had check boxes and put a stamp on it that said C letter of recommendation or just staple it to that or um, simply ignore the form for the most part and really just send in a letter of recommendation. But others, plenty of other teachers will fill out the form and also do a letter of recommendation. And there probably are schools where teachers would maybe just fill out the form and that would be it. So you're gonna work with whatever the teacher provides. What I do remember and what I did hear from my colleagues is that when there was a written evaluation, they paid much more attention to that than they did to the check boxes. Um, What sometimes you might see is that um, maybe there'd be something that stood out to you, like for the most part, the student was excellent, top 10% or very good, but then on one or two things, they might be one of the top few and that would catch your eye. Um, The reverse, of course, could also catch your eye, right? Where you're seeing mostly great scores and then maybe there were a couple where 
it was not great. And that might give you pause to, to think about it. But to me, the qualities that they're talking about are really the qualities that you, there's nothing hidden in my mind there about what they're looking for. Like, oh, I never knew they wanted to know if this student, yeah. um, you know, pressed their jeans for class, right? Or, um, <laughs> I don't know, is a really great athlete or contributes to the school community in an impactful way, right? That's not what they're asking about. They're really asking about who is the student who shows up in your class every day or every time the class meets? Yeah. And what are they bringing to that classroom environment? That's at the core of these 15 attributes. And it's not something that I would get too worked up about. Um, this is just what the colleges want to know. They want to know what kind of a student are we getting in the classroom? And that's the goal of these questions. Perfect. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, the next question comes in from Kathy and she asks, my son is an editor on his school newspaper, but the paper is part of a class, a journalism class, should he list the editor position in the activities section of the Common App since it's part of a class? How would you recommend highlighting his leadership role on the paper? Um, this is a really good question and I would ex expand this out because there are other things that students do that end up being kind of a hybrid, right? They are banned yeah. is sometimes a class. Yeah. Um, chorus is sometimes a class, uh, drama is sometimes a class, but then the student is also playing in the marching band uh, for football games on Friday nights during the season, or you're singing in the chorus on um, at different events around town, or you are putting the newspaper together and the work is done not only in class, but also done outside of class. So the first thing for me that determines whether it is an extracurricular activity in addition to a class is what's done outside of the class. If every bit of work is done in the class, that's a little bit trickier, but my guess is that at least some of the work, especially when you're an editor, is going to be done outside of class and on your own time. And that is when, in my mind, it becomes an extracurricular activity. What I would not do is I would not lump in the class time that you're putting towards the extracurricular to the hours per week and weeks per year that you're recording, right? Because that's already being counted as class time. So it would be everything above and beyond the class is what I would count for um, the extracurricular. So if you have band, and you have a band class once a day that meets for 45 minutes, I would not include that 45 minutes every day. But if in addition to that, you also practice at home for an hour, and then you also have marching band practice, and then you're also performing at different games, all of that time would be part of your extracurricular profile. And similarly, leadership would fit in well there, right? So if he is an editor of a section or something like that on the newspaper, um, again, you're gonna capture newspaper, the time he spends that is outside of class, and that would be the place to note that he is section editor or editor in chief or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, so that's how I would handle those extracurriculars that are a little bit more hybrid in nature. Uh, and the next one, maybe a little bit of a question for both of us, uh, it says, I know that schools pretend to be need blind, but in practice, it can't possibly be true with the cost of college, can it? <laughs> I love this. Like, I will, t I'll be as blunt as I can be. Colleges are really not out there trying to lie to you. I, I, I get that people find it hard to believe, but I really, I, I can't be clear. Maybe they're not always being as clear as you would like them to be, or maybe you feel that what happens doesn't match what you what they're saying because you don't understand how the end result came to be. But I really, I've been doing this work for almost 20 years now, um, both working at a university and now working in a place where I am working with students who are dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of universities. And I just simply not, it's not true. They're not lying. <laughs> so all of this to say, they're not pretending to be need blind. The reason they can be need blind is because they have enough money to do so. 
So the reason that not all colleges are need blind is because they don't have enough money to do so. It's pretty straightforward, right? Right. Um, and what need blind means is that whether or not you can afford to pay or whether or not you need financial aid has zero bearing on the decision making process when you are deciding who to admit. So when I was working at Penn, literally never came up once in the committee room if a student could afford to pay or not or if they needed financial aid or not. That was no part of our decision making process unless you were an international student and Penn is very upfront that they are need blind for everyone except for international students. And the reason for that is because there was a limited budget to fund financial aid for international students and Penn is also committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated need, which most schools that practice need blind admissions are. And what so for them, they weren't sure they could offer uh, financial aid, the amount of financial aid that every interna international student right. they accepted needed. So they had to balance those two budgets. Um, exactly right. Shannon, I, I don't know what you want to add here as someone who was on the finance side of yeah. this. And I'll say that there's one more category of school um, among the need blind schools. There's the very, very rich schools who just have the money and it's not a concern that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. There are also need blind schools who are need blind and do not commit to meeting 100% financial need. So actually when I worked at Boston University, BU at that time fell into that category. It does not anymore. It now does commit as of, uh, I think, uh, maybe Recently. two years ago. Yeah, one or two years ago, they started meeting full financial need. But when I worked there, they did not. So we did not look at a family's ability to pay in our admissions process. We were truly need blind, but the catch was when, it, when your file came over from admi admissions accepted you, you came over to us in financial aid. We didn't sort of care if you needed money or not because we weren't necessarily going to give it to you. We would right. accept you and then say, you can figure out how to pay. Right. <laughs> so that, that's the other schools who are need blind are either very rich and can meet everyone's full needs. So it's not really a concern or they're not going to meet people's full needs. So it, it's not a concern because they basically make it the family's <laughs> concern. Right. They'll accept you and then you can figure out how to pay. Uh, and in contrast to that, the other school I worked at Tufts University was a need aware school because like you were talking about with international students at Penn, we did commit to meeting everyone's full need. Mm -hmm. And we made the decision that if we could not um, meet your full need, maybe we would not accept you. Um, so if a school, there's the very, very rich schools who aren't worried about it. If a school does not, is not very rich, <laughs> does not have the money to meet everyone's full need, they have to just kind of go one or two paths. <laughs> you right. know, we'll either be need aware, look at it in our admissions process and only accept the number of students with the amount of need we can fulfill, or we're going to go the other way. We're not going to look at it in the admissions process, um, but we're just going to not uh, meet your need and you're going to have to figure out how to pay. So if a school is not very rich, they have to go one of those two ways. But I would totally agree with you, Beth, in terms of schools are not lying. Right. <laughs> about that. If a school says they, they are need blind, they, they truly are. Uh, I think a lot of the suspicion around that is because people are looking for a reason. Why did my kid yes. not get into this school? My you know, is it's usually a very selective school and my kid gets great grades and has great test scores. They seem are seemingly doing everything right and they didn't get in. What could possibly the reason? Oh, it must be because we needed money. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the other thing is um, and we're almost here at the end of our time. But um, the other thing that can happen, too, is that even at the schools where they are need aware, um, what we hear from our colleagues who worked at Need Aware Schools, and you were there, but not in the necessarily in the admissions room, is that it really came down to like a handful of students who were very much on the bubble, um, and so it was. There were many students who needed a lot of aid, who they would happily admit, and then there would, it, you know, there would be literally a handful at the end of the process where they would say, "Ugh." 
we just don't have enough money to fund the students, so we are not going to admit them. And I also think that the the thought that that's your student is all out of proportion with the amount of time with the number of times it actually is that that happened to your student, right? It's correct. It's still pretty limited. So yeah, agreed. All right. Well, Shannon, as always, thank you so much for joining today. I really appreciate it. Oh, you are so welcome. My pleasure. Um, when I am doing these Q&As with someone other than Shannon, I'm always a little thrown because we always do these together. <laughs> so it's fun. Um, all right. Really quickly, a few things. Next week, Sally is hosting um, and we're actually welcoming a public school counselor um, who has insight into the impact of the pandemic on their students. Um, we thought that would be interesting to hear. And then we're also going to be talking about grants and scholarships, which I know many of you are interested in. I'll put in another plug to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the easier it is for others to find us. Um, if you have questions, uh, you as you can see, Shannon and I had a lot today, although we could have answered more. Uh, so send them to us. We can, we'll take them via Facebook. We'll take them via Instagram at College Coach BH. Um, you could send them to me on Instagram at Elizabeth Heaton 92. You could email them to us, gettingin.voiceamerica at gmail.com. You can tweet them at us. Uh, you can send them to us on LinkedIn. We have so many different ways that you can get us those questions. Um, if you are wondering, gee, I wonder if they've covered this topic on the podcast recently or in the past. We make write a blog about every single podcast that we do. So if you go to our blog and you search for a topic, it will pop up if we did a podcast on that. And so you'll know exactly where to go to find that um, that podcast and the subject of interest. Um, also, sign up for our blog, blog.getintocollege.com. And don't forget, we are here every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Pacific.